Okay, here we go. Um, yep, so like I said, I'm going to do problems uh, three and five today. And then for the other problems, you can look at the, uh, the other recording of the problem solving session that was done this morning. So problems three and five. Okay, and I'll do, um, I'll do three first. I'll just do them in order. Okay, so um, yeah, and please ask if you have any questions, you know, just put them in the chat and I'll, I'll have a look. Okay, so for three, we have this type of uh, unordered pairs. So let me just uh, recap that. So we have unordered pairs. And we also have the assumption that A here is a finite type. Okay, so everything we're going to do is going to be for some finite type A. And then this is defined as the sigma type for X in B as two and then X in A. Okay, let me just remind you what this is, this thing here. Right, so BS2, this just means that we have a, an X in U, so we have a type. And moreover, we know that X is merely equal to the type with two, uh, two elements, also known as the booleans. Okay, um, so that's, that's all that this is. This is just a shorthand for that. Okay, so we take a bunch of types that are merely equal to bool, and then we take maps from X into A. That's the type of unordered pairs. And then in this exercise, we're going to sort of see how this kind of plays out. Okay, um, so the first exercise is to construct an embedding uh, from this type, well, into this type. So we're, what we want is we want A choose bool, and then we want this map here um, ordered pairs into A, okay? Um, and then it's good to recall the definition so that Egbert gave in the lecture. So remember, this is defined to be, um, let me just look up my notes, just to make sure I don't mess this up. So this is by definition X in BS2, such that we have a decidable embedding into A, right? That's just the definition, it's just this type. Okay, so what's the map going to be? Well, the map is going to uh, be kind of straightforward. So I'm just expanding the types here. We have X in BS2 and then a map from X into A. So what we're gonna do here is take an X, take an E, and then approve that E is a decidable embedding, right? And we simply map it to X and E. We just forget that it is a decidable embedding and that's it. And this is an embedding because, um, because this thing here is a, is a property of the map, right? So in other words, two decidable embeddings are equal precisely when they're equal as maps. So that's why this map is an embedding. And, um, and then that's, that's what's going on here. And, and just to understand a little bit, so then the point is that on the right hand I'm sorry. Side, yeah, go ahead. So the second map doesn't necessarily need to be an embedding though, right? Uh, over here, you mean? Yes. Yes, exactly, exactly. Okay. So, so on the right here, we were, not we're not necessarily looking at embedding. So that's why we're, we're forgetting this here, right? Well, yeah, um, but we're forgetting the decidability part. No, we're also forgetting that it's an embedding. Yes, I agree. Yes, I agree. I was just saying, okay, I understand. Yep. Um, and actually, okay, so thanks for the question because that brings me to the next bit, which is like, because you forget this, on the right-hand side, you have more stuff, right? So here we have more because, for example, uh, we could take uh, like a to be uh, the, like, well, maybe not used to, let me use bull, right? Um, then on the right-hand side, 
you can have a map from bool into bool, which and and so it just selects two elements. So you have, kind of have something like true, true. You can select true twice, but on the right hand side, the thing has to be an embedding, so it has to be left cancelable. So you have to like if you pick something here, you have to pick a a unique thing on the right hand side. So here you cannot have these duplicates. So over here you would only get true, false and false true but you you wouldn't get this uh, these duplicates for them okay um, so why can't you get duplicates because because the map the map so the map here if you kind of specialize a little bit um is just going like if you take x to be bool then it just selects two elements right it's just a map from the two element type into a so you just need to pick two elements but you have to, the map has to be an embedding. So in particular, it has to be uh, injective. So you can't pick the same thing for two elements of X because that would not be an injective map. And you can't just send everything to the- to Oh, you're the, giving the pair. You're giving the pair. Okay, yes, I yeah, I'm giving the pair. Okay. Um, so that's, that's, that's like, you know, the difference here that's going on. So. Uh, and that goes back to like the requirement that here we have a decidable embedding, but on the right hand side, we no longer have this. So this, these kind of things wouldn't be in the image. You wouldn't be hitting those things. What was the definition of decidable embedding again? Uh, yep. So that is a good question. So decidable embedding means you have uh, E into this, uh, right? You have an embedding. So that's one thing. And then it being decidable means that all the fibers are decidable. Um, so decidable means uh, that for every A in A, the fiber of E and A is decidable, right? And remember that this here is sigma X such that E of X equals A. So in other words, if you give me an A, if you give me something in the right-hand side, I can decide whether there is an X such that it maps to A. And there is at most one because this thing is an embedding. Okay, that's what the definition is. Is that clear it up? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Uh, thanks for the questions. I really like them, so please keep them coming. Um, and actually, this is a very common uh sort of i'm not sure what the right word is not really quite a trick but like uh let's say a theme that you kind of say that a map is something if all of the fibers are it that's like kind of kind of what you do in in type theory and a lot of uh, mathematics as well um sometimes you even define a type to be something if like the map from that type into one uh satisfies the property you kind of reverse this this, um, this this kind of thing, but anyway, I'm I'm digressing a bit. Um, but it's usually a good guess, like when someone says the map is X, to say, oh, okay, you you mean that the fibers satisfy X. Um, that's what I was trying to say. Okay, um, let's look at B, which is actually a little bit um, a little bit tricky, but kind of nice to do. So the point is that we um, we want to look at, so we want to look at this unordered pairs uh, on A into B, where this is a set on the one hand, and then we want this to be, we want an equivalence uh, with the type of um like commutative binary operations from a to b so what do i mean i mean you you take a map from a to a into b right so this is a binary operation from a to b such that uh if you take two things in a then m of x of a is the same thing as m of y of x right it's commutative the order doesn't matter so the operation doesn't care which way you put the arguments um, so that's kind of interesting, right? So if I 
restrict to B being a set, then this kind of sort of high powered, you know, notion of unordered pairs using the truncation here and, you know, a little bit involved um, is actually equivalent to just having a commutative binary operation from A to B. Um, so this, let's say, is a bit more low level description of things, right? But it kind of shows that it, this, this notion here uh, generalizes that somewhat. Okay, so the, the point is to, to prove this. And um, what I would like to do is I would like to prove this not by directly giving maps back and forth and then having to show that, you know, if you go, if you apply one and then the other, then you get the original back and, and vice versa, because that would be a lot of work. And I would kind of have to hand wave it um, in order to, to really like get it down into any reasonable time. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start over here uh, with this type unordered pairs into A into B. And then I'm going to do like a series of equivalences, almost like equational reasoning, but now with equivalences. And each, each one of them will be like a tiny step in a way um, that is hopefully clear. And, and then sort of we build it up as we go along. Um, rather than giving the maps like in one go. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. Thanks. Thanks for the feedback. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's try and do this. Um, so we're gonna, well, first we're gonna expand some definitions. So we're gonna start with this unordered pairs on A into B. Okay, so let's just expand this a bit. So by definition, this is the type of these things, X into A, and then going into B. Okay, that's just the definition. And I could actually expand it a little bit more. So this is X in some universe U and such that um, x is merely equal to bull and then a map from x into a and then to b so okay. can i can i just stop right here just for one second yeah. so this is where a minute ago you talked about this and you kind of said it was an abuse of notation right because really so, you think, so x because wasn't bs2 defined to be a pair it was defined to right. be like sigma x u such that it's merely yeah. equal to bool. So really x should be like a different variable here. Like we shouldn't be reasoning, but the abuse is fine. Like I understand. What yeah, I mean, saying. technically I should be writing a PR, PR one. Or that, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, I got you. Um, yeah. Because I'm, I'm looking at the type here, but it's right. very typical. But this is a common actually, thing to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is very common, especially when the other components are propositions. Right, because right. Their property, you don't really like, you know, once there can only be one thing, right? So you, there's no need in a way to specify them. This is extremely common. Um, but exactly. you're absolutely right. Formally speaking, like if I had to do this in Agda, Agda would complain to me and would say, you, are you crazy? Like you can't do this. Right. right. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Valid point. Absolutely. So thanks. Um, okay. So um, then there is this, this, this thing here where on the left-hand side, I have a sigma type and, and then I'm mapping that into something. So I can, like, you can sort of read this as saying, yeah, if you give me an X with this thing and you give me a map from X to A, then I will give you a B. So I can kind of query or unquery, I never know which is which, but you can kind of massage that in a little bit into the following form. You can say, well, it's equivalent to give me a type. Um, tell me that X is merely equivalent to bull. Then give me a map from X to A, and then I will give you a B. Right? These things are this, this is just like sort of high level currying in a way. But fear, here you have to give all of the things at once. And here I'm giving them one step at a time. Okay, but that's, that's all that's going on. 
Okay. Um, right. So now what we would like to do is we would somehow like to make use of, of this thing here, right? Because it would be kind of convenient to, to use this truncation somehow and to, to make this a little bit easier. In particular, if we look at the type here, you'll notice that this only mentions A and B, right? There's no sort of quantification over all types or anything like that. So I, I have to get rid of the X somehow. That's gonna be like a thing here. And of course, um, as you may remember, we have that this type X in U such that X equals bull, right? If let's say on like, let's say I don't have the truncation, this type is actually equivalent to the one point type by the contractibility, right? This is the, this is, this is like, you know, maybe you've seen it in this form, X, X and X, X equals Y, which is right. Y fixed. So that's gonna be sort of what we would like to do. So can we use like the universal property for propositional truncation to get rid of the truncation? Right, right. That's an excellent that's an excellent suggestion, but we have to be slightly careful because normally the universal property for the truncation only applies when we're mapping oh, yeah, into the proposition. proposition, right? But here, uh, this this thing is a set, um, which means that actually the type of these things is also a set. Uh, I mean, in general, it's true that if you have a, if you look at uh, like maps from, from U into V, then this will be a set as soon as V is a set. And unfortunately, this is where a nice theorem is in. So I would like to spend, I don't know, a couple of minutes, maybe just mentioning the theorem. I'm not going to prove it, but I just want to mention it. Um, so this is, made a note of the theorem number in Egbert's book. So this is theorem 14. 0.46 in, uh, in Egbert's book. And, and that says that, um, that basically says that you have, an, so if you have X into Y, and this is a set, then this type is equivalent, and I will explain why in a second, to maps from F into X such that um, for every x x prime in x, f of x equals f of x prime. So in other words, it is equivalent. So this, this is expressing f is constant, right? Any two values outputs the same. Okay, like I, I told you that I'm not gonna do the proof, but what is sort of the high level intuition here? The intuition is as follows. If you wanna give a map, like from the truncation of X into, into Y, um, then like this map is sort of saying, well, you know that X has a point, but you don't know which. And from this knowledge, you have to produce a Y somehow. In other words, this map can like it can only be constant because it it can't even know about different things in X. It can't discriminate on those kind of things. So it kind of has to be constant. And then there's a little trick involved to show that actually you can do this, right? But that's why, in a way, the map has to be constant because it can't know. It can only know that X has some element, and that's it. Um, and so you select some Y for that particular thing, and that's it. Okay, so you can look at the proof for a more convincing argument, um, but I would just like to use it in this case. Um, I can say more about it maybe at the end or in you know, Discord if you're interested. Um, it's a kind of a nice theorem that is comes in quite useful in a lot of places. Um, okay, I wrote the word intuition there and then I didn't write anything, but I explained it uh, verbally at least. Okay, so we're gonna apply this theorem um, at this point here. So here we did a uh, curry, maybe on curry, I don't 
well, one of these directions should be curving and the other is something. Um, so here we're going to do theorem 14, 4, 6. Okay. Um, so this will be x and u, and then it will be uh, f going from x equals bull to x a into b, such that uh, if I have e1 and then e2 of this type, saying that x equals bull, then f of e1 equals f of e2. Okay, that was me applying the theorem. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, right. Now, what do we do next? So next up, Um, is the following. So here we have a pi and then a sigma. So pi sigma is the same thing as giving another function by what is sometimes known as the type theoretic axiom of choice, right? But it's saying for every x, give me a map, blah, 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 blah. Well, actually, that's the same thing as just giving me the map. So let me just put type theoretic axiom of choice. It's a bit of a misnomer, actually. Um, so then we have f, which says, okay, give me an x in u, such that if this and this, then I will give you a b. And then here we have to translate the, the condition on the right to the new setting. Uh, but this is just going to say that you give me an x here and you give me e1 and e2 such that x equals bull, then f of x1 equals f of x e2. Okay, so another step. And now we're kind of we're kind of getting somewhere. Um, uh, okay, so then this, um, then I'm going to apply like the same sort of trick where this pi type, uh, so above over here, I translated the sigma here on the left into this pi, right, by currying. So now I can do the same thing, but, but do it in here. And now, and now instead, I'm going to turn this, the pi into a sigma. So this will be a big sigma of f, which takes an x in u and x equals bull. And then, and it gives me an extra, this is very, and then this is all repeated. Okay, stays the same. Uh, now it's time for a new page. Just gonna move the zoom controls out of the way. But how did you make the last sigma? Ah, uh, yeah. So what I did is I I noticed here that okay. So intuitively, this says give me an x, then uh, approve that x equals bull, and then the rest. And then this is just saying give me the x and the proof like together. And All right. Answer. So that's, fine, that's fine to call it curry because we talked about that but i mean more explicitly that's like the sigma induction principle right like that's how you introduce a a function on sigma right like yeah. right in order to like yeah exactly you give the first argument and then the second yeah exactly. right right yep yeah yeah no excellent it's kind of like generalizes the yeah, I mean, it's, it's a sum, right? You gotta say what you do with the first, yeah. No, exactly. Um, okay. Now, remember, all the way up here, 
a couple of steps ago, we we had this you know this observation that the sigma over x such that x equals bo will be contractible, and actually this will of course be contractible at a particular point, right? It will be a bo raffle. That that's the unique point there. And so finally, we're at a position where we can do this. Where we can use this fact. So that's what I'm going to do now. So then this thing, I'm going to say by contractability at all and, and raffle. OK. So let me write this down. So I'm going to have f. And I'm just going to like lower piece of here. So now X, I can just completely fix. I don't longer need to uh, like quantify or read using the sigma. I'm going to have bool instead because I will contract it at that particular point. So I'm going to have this. And then there will no longer be a pi over X in U because this is now bool. But this thing will still be like this bit here, this will still be there, but it will be uh, instantiated with x equals bool. Okay, so then this is going to be e1, e2, um, bool equals bool, and then f. Uh, okay, now I need to think. Um, Ah, sorry, I forgot here. Um, yeah, no, I think we're gonna have, sorry about that. I think we're gonna have uh, F all equals all uh, X, sorry, not X, Bull into A into B. Sorry, that stays. And then now this makes more sense because now we can kind of repeat what we had before. We have F of E1 equals F of E2. Okay, so I fixed X to be bull in this case. I'm, I'm not quite sure that how we use contracting because whenever you contract away, you should lose the whole sigma type, right? Like you should, the X in you mm. and, and the path X equals bull, that should all be equivalent to one. Right, okay, yeah, actually maybe, maybe I messed up here. So let's try and fix this. Um, let's try and, yeah, you may be right, hang on. Um, so if we contract this, what do we get? And either way, somehow bull has to magically turn into A. I mean, you seem to have some idea about how that's going to happen. No, the bull. Okay, so actually, I can say a little bit about this. So the bull is not going to turn into A. Um, oh, it helps us define a binary operation there somehow. Yes, exactly. So bull is going to is going to say like pick two elements of A. We're going to have bull oh, into A. Oh, like okay, A. I okay. Yep. Um, but yeah, you're right. There's something fishy going on here. Let me try and figure this out. Uh, it's always a bit risky when trying to do this on the fly. It might be. It might be worthwhile to start at the bottom direction and work up and see if we can make a meet in the middle. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, we could do that. Although I'm just thinking that it's a little bit risky uh, in the sense that. The bottom thing is so simple, it's kind of hard to make it more complicated. Um, but I think, okay, let, let me just try something. Um, let me just try and train and it works out. So, okay, if we contract this, then we're going to have F from uh, F from bull into A into B. I think that should still be okay. Mm, yep. And then the pi type is fixed. 
Yeah, okay. I think I think what I wrote there actually before was okay. So we're gonna have this. But now the question is how does how do we apply like these things? Uh, so one thing is is you there. called capital F a different name a minute ago because it was like you were realizing, you know, we've got to make a new function. Yeah, I mean we can we can keep well I yeah, so main, I think what it should be is like um yeah so uh, how does the new function yeah. take in a bool right so i think it should be bool yeah so the question is how does um the contractability sort of interact with yeah uh with the rest of it um let me see if i can it should be I guess you could just define G E one to definitionally be capital F bull E one, right? Like that's what it is, right? Mm. No, but the, the problem is that G doesn't take an equality. And yeah, yeah. Like, no. Oh, okay. That's that's kind of the thing. Um, but it should still be it should take. Oh, okay, I see. Hmm. So maybe it's something like B and oh no G G is defined to be F of E one because once no, you take I, okay, so, hang on but this this thing doesn't make sense I think yeah fine uh but um mm. so here we should have G from bull to A to B. So that's the contractability. And then how does the, what is the new sort of, um, you know, what does the new thing become? That's, that's the thing. Yeah, so okay. we should still have the pi type here, bull equals bull. But now how does it interact with G? That's kind of the point. But I guess what I'm saying is, is if you give f the appropriate pair, it turns in it mat the function type matches, right? Like if you give f a sigma, then you get, you know, an x to a to b, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, I think I think it should be, it sh I think it should be this. So g like a little g, if you give me this thing, then I believe it should be the case that g um, g of g uh, and then like this. Okay. So where I'm writing the, the twiddle to be sort of the equivalence corresponding to the equality here, right? So that will give me a map from bull to bull, and then I can pre-compose that with G, which is going from bull to A. Um, I'm, yeah, I think this should be it, but it's maybe non-trivial to, to, to fully work that out. Um, but you can, okay, so one thing you can do is you can further extend, um, you can further extend this bit, like the equality of the functions here using function extensionality, saying that for any two inputs, they will have the same output. So that's kind of what this pi type here is doing. And then I just need to figure out how they interact. And I think this should be the correct way of interacting once you compute through what this equivalence is doing. Um, but I, I have to be honest, and I would say I would like to see a little bit more uh, detail um with that but i'm also tempted to take it on faith a little bit now just so that we can sort of do the rest of it um and, and get through the sheet and then i can double check so that like once the solutions are available um or maybe after a session i can, can double check this um i don't know how people feel about that uh, but this like you know one way or another like some variation of this should be uh, should be where we're heading um, for reasons that we're gonna we're gonna see in a bit because we're actually quite close to getting 
um, to getting what we want now because currently we're only just looking at bull and then we can we can get pretty close here. Um, so I'm hoping that's okay with people. Um, yeah, I'm okay with it. I mean, I believe it. Maybe take this. Okay, that's good. That's reassuring. Uh, yeah, but thank you for pointing out the the thing about the effort. That was that was that was um yeah that was just incorrect. You have the contractability, and then you have to you have to figure out how that interplays. Um, there should be some theorem like a general recipe, um, that does that. But I think it should be this. Um, but okay, maybe here I should put a like a double check that this is indeed the case. Okay, um, then let's let's proceed from here. So uh, first, I'm gonna do bold to A to B. I'm just gonna leave this for now. Um, but note, okay, so by univalence, right? We can replace uh, this bit here by bull equivalent to bull. Um, but so who can tell me what are the equivalences between bull and bull? I'm sure one of you will know. If you're not comfortable like being in the recording, just say it on the chat. That's fine too. Sorry, what was the question? So what are what are the equivalences between bull and bull? There's two or is it? Yep. Okay, and which the identity two and the swap? Exactly. Exactly. So we have it and swap, also some correct answers in the chat, thank you. So we have it and swap down here. So, I mean, yeah, we can do this big pi type over all of them, right? But we kind of know which ones there are, they're just exactly two. So this means that we're really just looking at bull to A, and then uh, here we have G. So then we take in uh, a G and then like, we can just fix one of them to be the identity. Right, so we put like it here, and the other one we take to be uh, swap. I mean, in case that we pick the same one, then this condition is completely. Then this condition will always hold. Right, there's nothing to check. So this is like the only non-trivial thing here, and so you can you can kind of do that. That's why that's okay. It um, just just real quick, if we were being like yeah. super rigorous, like. Would yeah. we need to make this like a co-product, like of the four possibilities? Uh, Do you get what I'm yeah, saying? I mean, like, could, a, yeah. So you could have like G after G. It should be G after uh, this one, right? But this one kind of holds trivially. Right. And then the same thing for for swap. Oh, I get how all the cases hold trivially. I'm just trying to figure yeah. out if I wanted to write out these equivalents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, in no, it full would be, rigor. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So I'm, I'm being like, I'm being a little bit quick here and I'm going to say, well, I'm not going to write this one. And obviously, you know, the- But it would be a co-product though, like just to clarify, like do you think like, like um, four pluses? It would be, uh, yeah, yeah, it would be, yeah. It would be just a co-product of these things. Um, like, yeah, you can, I mean, you could equal, yeah. Um, yeah, it's just, just the four cases and then you have to write them out. Um, okay. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for clarifying. Okay, now we're getting there. Okay, so we've been looking at this bull to A this entire time. Um, let's bring that sort of down to earth because what, so what does this do, right? It takes false to an element and it takes true to an element. We just select two elements in A. So really what we're looking at is we're looking at um, G and then A cross A, if you like, into B. And so what happens here is that, so then under this, let's say, um, under this uh, viewpoint, we have kind of X and Y and A cross A here, right? I'm just replacing both A by A cross A. And then under that viewpoint, we have that this is just saying that if I do the identity, right, I don't do anything, it should be the same thing as uh, swapping them. So there we go. Okay, but now, um, now, now we're pretty much 
where we wanted to where wanted to be just modulo so I'm renaming and and currying currying again actually because now you can curry the a times a to b as a and then a and then b and then you have the pi here um, x and y a and then we have m x equals m y x and there we go okay so quite a few steps and i think probably you would trust me that if you were to write this down well i think at least that if you were to write this down like let's say directly instead of doing it in all these tiny steps where even i had to you know skip some of the details um, in order to not take forever um i think writing writing two maps directly would just be kind of painful um, because you would have to kind of go through the same process but just all in one go um yeah sorry about the slip up here um when we kind of sorted it in the end um, and it's good to see people make mistakes i suppose it keeps you on your toes um okay I think that was probably the hardest thing we were going to do tonight. Um, so now we can sort of sit back a little bit. Um, so for C, um, this is actually a kind of a nice instantiation of B. Um, so we have uh, undirected uh, graphs in U. So these are defined to be V and U, and then looking at unordered Paris in V into prop. Okay, why is this the type of undirected graphs? Well, notice that what we're sort of doing here is we're taking a pair and then we're sending it to a proposition. So think of this as saying, um, these are like the uh, uh, these are like the edges, if you like, right? So this is saying if you if you have x equals y is like sorry if you have a pair x y, then you're sort of saying are they uh, related, right? Or are they connected uh, through an edge? And why is it undirected? Well, because I'm looking at unordered pairs, right? So I don't care about the direction here. And so this gives me the undirected. Yep, and then I'm looking at all of them because I'm taking the big sigma type uh, over this. And then all of the kind of possible ways I could connect them. Does that make sense? Yep, okay, I see some nodes, makes sense. Okay, and then we want this to be equivalent to um, equivalent to take a V, take uh, E, and then this is going from V to V to prop. So E is extends for edges here, right? That's how we think of this, such that for every two vertices, right? That's how we think of V. E of x, y implies E of y, x. Okay, so are these things equivalent? Uh, yes, and we only need to do sort of very little work uh, because we can apply B. Okay, so why can we apply B by part B? Um, and this is okay. Because props are said. Yes, exactly, since prop is a set, right? So the type of all propositions is itself a set. So we can do this. Um, very good observation. So then we have unordered pairs V into prop. Okay, this will be the same thing. And now I just replace everything under the sigma, right? I still take the big sigma type, but then I replace it by something underneath. So now we have M from V to V to prop, and then for every X and Y B, M of X, Y equals M of Y, X. This is part B, um, but this is the same thing as all of that. And then M of X, Y, if we make it an equivalence, or yeah, right. Right, because these are propositions. Propositions, yeah. 
So propositional so is, extensionality. Yes, propositional extensionality. Okay, um, but actually then this is equivalent to the whole thing. Um, and then just requiring one direction because the other one you, you get by symmetry. I mean, as soon as you have this, you get the other one. Um, so it's just being a little bit economical there. Symmetry. Okay, there we go. Um, so yeah, all the work was kind of done by, by part B there um, using this kind of high powered and the theorem we can get there pretty quick. Okay, um, yeah, any questions about that before we move on to part B? All good, everyone happy? Cool. Then let's um, let's look at part B. So part B was something that Egbert also mentioned in the lecture, um, and it's sort of concerned with having with, with looking at um, looking at equivalence relations or partitions through different lenses, but showing that they're all equivalent. Uh, I think in the in the lecture Egbert mentioned a few ways of getting these equivalences, um, but he wanted us to sort of go through it at a slightly more leisurely pace. Um, so let's try and do this. So we fix um, A a finite type. And then we look at the following things. So we look at number one. This is the, um, the type of decidable equivalence relations on A. Um, just let me know either by unmuting or chat if you would like to recall, if you would like me to recall what a decidable equivalence relation is. Yep, okay, will do. So an equivalence relation, well, let me just use this, this um, like a prox symbol, right? So on A, we have A and B, this is a, this will be a decidable proposition so that's what this bit um, is saying and we moreover we have three axioms so we we should have that a is related to a right so this is reflexivity um we should have that if a is related to b then b is related to a this is symmetry and finally if a is related to b and B is related to C, then A is related to C. Of course, all of these are quantified over, uh, right, for every A, B, and C, and for every A, this one, right? So translate. Yep, so it's kind of, it's, uh, yeah, equality is an example of an equivalence relation, but it could identify more things, right? Um, and then the decidability condition is just that this thing is a decidable proposition. In other words, if I give you two elements, you can decide whether they are related or whether they are not related. Okay, um, then we have number two, which is the type of surjective maps A to X with X finite. Okay. Would anyone like me to recap the definition of surjective um, in homotopy type theory? Don't see anyone in chat. No? All good? Okay. Um, so you may recall those lecture 10. Okay. It's been a while. Um, it involves the, the truncation. Um, okay, we'd like to see that these two things are equivalent. So before I write down all the other ones, let's see that these two are in fact uh, the same thing. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll I'll sketch maps uh, going back and forth in this case, um, and then sort of explain why you know they yield the same result if you apply them one after another. Okay, so to go from. Um, to two, what do you do? So let's suppose that you have this thing, a decidable um, equivalence relation on A. 
actually because this symbol is kind of painful to write let me just write r okay um would also help me a little bit on why okay so now we we have this thing and we would like to define a surjection um with with x being finite um now if you if you kind of know about equivalence relations then sort of the next thing that comes into mind is a quotient because what you would like to do is you would like to quotient up um things that are that are equal so what we're going to do is we have um, a mod r so this is the quotient of a by r so in here uh, we're going to have like if i have an x and y in here or sorry um yeah let me turn this way uh, we have this quotient and there's a map a that we are right like this so that sends an element to its equivalence class right to the in, in the quotient um, and this is a surjection and uh, so this is a surjection and then we have to check that this quotient here is finite right because that was included here that we have this rejection into a finite type so why is this type finite and there's actually two reasons so first of all a is finite um, but also r is decidable um, so in a way if you would if you have to decide how many elements this has you kind of just start with an element a and then you say okay how many things is it related to you bunch of all of those things up right and you could do this because it's, it's a decidable thing and a is finance you can just like go over all of them and bunch them up and then you check okay what what else do i have left and you check okay what is that related to and you bunch those all up and, do you, and, and then you keep going until you're out of elements and you can kind of do this procedure because a is finite and r is decidable okay that's that's like the, the high level sketch of why this is a funny thing uh okay and then what do you do in the other um in the other direction in the other direction you kind of look at what this map does so this map sends two things to the same element precisely if they are related by the quotient uh, sorry by the by the relation so if we are given q from a to x um, surjective with x finite then we define r from a to a to prop by saying a is related to b this will be the case if q of a equals q of b okay now there's a couple of things to check here um namely uh well there's actually quite a few so first of all we we said that this will go into a prop right so is this actually is this thing is this prop valued and why but it is because x is finite in particular it is a set right every finite type is a set mm, so it's um, a quality so, yes x is a set you were saying uh just that if it's a set by definition it's a quality or its identity yes. is a property yeah so exactly. why was that set though we just said it was fine right so it has to be a set yes yeah you can prove this so it, it would be like a little lemma um, okay. because this one it is fine right actually return to this in a sec um okay then you have to prove that uh you have the, the three properties of an equivalence relation and this is an equivalence relation in a way because 
because uh, identity equality. is yeah. right exactly reflexivity okay you get it because equality is reflexive transitivity you get it because the equality is transitive and so on and then finally you want this to be um we actually wanted this we're not just going to prop but we wanted it to go into deep right one of the equivalence relation to be decidable and the equality here in fact is decidable um as x is finite so that's another thing, another like little lemma that you would need to prove that if you have a finite type, then you can decide equality. But it shouldn't be too surprising. It's, if Wouldn't it's that also type. follow from the fact that X is a set? Um, if don't, you sets have, it, don't sets have decidable equality? Um, not all sets have decidable equality, but every oh, type why has decidable think? equality is a set. Yes. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. okay, okay. Good point. So yeah, yeah. So this direction would be fine. So yeah, you're right. If if actually if I did this, then I would have gotten the other one for pedagogical reasons. I wanted to do it this way around, but I would like to thank you for bringing it up because I was going to go there exactly next. Yep. So that's the direction that you have. So as soon as this this thing has decidable equality, then um, you would get this. Okay. Um, and then you have to, you know, you have to see that these things are actually kind of inverses, but and that's. Um, I mean, it has to be a little bit of work in checking, but I think it's kind of uh, obvious that this uh, this happens um, because the yeah the relation here is just exactly saying that the thing maps to the same equivalence class. And anyway, we don't have time to uh, cover that completely, so I'm gonna leave that, but just give you these these details to work on. Okay, um, then we introduce. The next candidate, which is three. So this is the type of finite types. I also know that we've been we're like we're closing in on the one hour mark, but I think I'll make this a little bit longer just so that I can finish up five and I hope and expect that it won't take more than half an hour. So uh sorry if you were uh, settling in for an hour, but I think it will be good to finish it. Um, the type of finite types X equipped with uh, Y, X into fin. Um, actually, yeah, let me just use the same notation as I heard, actually, and I write down this bold face F here, but the finite types, right? So equipped with this thing such that each y of x is inhabited meaning the truncation right holds and um, equipped with e which is an equivalence of the sigma over y um, with a Okay, and then we would like to see that one, uh, I mean, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show that two and three are equivalent, right? So two and three equivalence. And then by composing, you would get the equivalence with one. Um, okay, so let's do one to, oh, so two to three, I mean. Two to three. Okay, so we're given um, S from A to X surjective and X finite. And then we have to give this family here. And it's sort of like a standard trick. And I think Egbert also mentioned this in the lecture to uh, take fibers. Uh, when you're given a map, then an easy way to get a family is to take the fiber. So um, you can do X into uh, F, and then we send X to uh, sigma A in A, such that S of A equals X. Um, right, this is, by definition, this is the fiber of S at the element x okay 
Um, first of all, let us check that this thing is actually a finite type, but that's okay because um, A is, a, so this is a finite type and uh, X has decidable equality because it is finite. So we can actually decide this. So you can just count the number of elements that satisfy this. You can count the number of A's that are mapped to X. Um, so that's, that's okay. Um, then we need that every, uh, like the family is inhabited in every X. So Y of X uh, is inhabited. Well, because precisely because S is surjective, right? By definition. By definition, being surjective means that all the fibers are inhabited. And so we're done. And moreover, we need an equivalence. So we need that if we take um, the total space of this thing, so if we look at this, um, this by definition is just x in x, a a, s of a equals x, but this, um, so I'm sure you've seen maybe a number of times already is equivalent to a. This is just a general effect. Um, uh, over, the, over the fiber when you take the total space. Um, so that's fine too. And then we go back. So now we're given uh, X finite and a family of finite types such that Y of X is inhabited and we're given like a specific equivalence from this total space um, onto A. And what we need is we need, so we need S from A to X surjective. Um, well, I mean, really we need, um, you know, some other type like X prime here, but we can actually like with X prime finite, but we'll, we're gonna take the same thing. Um, so what we do is uh, we look at A, we use E here to get an equivalence to this total space uh, like that. And then we project down to X, right? Okay, so, um, so this is finite by assumption, so then we're done. Oh, but why is this map surjective? So this is surjective because if we have an X and X. If you give me something on the right-hand side, I need to produce something on the left-hand side. Now the map E is an equivalent, so it can always just go back. So really the point is to get something there, right? Then, uh, but if I have an X and X, then Y of X is inhabited. Um, and so using that, I can construct a guy here that gets mapped to X down there. And so we're we're done. That's why the map is in a, uh, sorry, that's why the map is a surjection because y of x is in a. Okay, so that takes care of the equivalence of two and three. Um, where two and three are kind of close in spirit. Um, I would say probably closest. Um, yeah, then you would have to show that like doing the round trips uh, amounts to the identity. Um, which I guess is not too, yeah, I mean, you have to, you have to do it. You have to do a little bit of, a little bit of work. Um, but it basically amounts to just looking at a given map as, um, as, as, as looking at the projection from the fiber in general. Like, anyway, I don't want to take too much time. Uh, anyway. Um, okay, so then we get to the last formulation, which is the one with uh, partitions, decidable partitions. 
And I think that's really the trickiest one. So maybe it's good to spend a little bit of time on that. So that's four. I think there's maybe just in my version, there's still a one there, but it should be four. So this is the type of decidable partitions of A. Okay, so what is that? That is the type. So how many? A type of all uh, A's. So what does P do? So P takes um, uh, a map from A into decidable propositions and then gives you a decidable proposition. Okay, so this you should think of this as a decidable subset of A. That's a good way to think about this. Um, and so what P is doing, P is saying, I'm going to partition all of the elements, right? All of the, all of the elements, like if you, if you look at all of them, yeah, I mean, it's just part, it's like a, a way of, of distributing these, these subsets here. Um, but everything is inside is decidable because that's what we've been doing all the time. Um, okay, but there should be some conditions such that uh, each, um, such that, okay, let me spell this out a bit, such that for every Q from A to B prop, if B Q, then Q is inhabited. And really this means that uh, let me look at the total space here. So A in A such that Q of A, this thing, right? Uh, in other words, you wanna make sure that the partition doesn't include, like the partition should only include uh, inhabited things. Okay. And so that's one condition. And the other condition is that for each um, X in A, the type, uh, if you look at all of the cues that are in P and contain X, this should be contracted. So in other words, the an element can only be in like one thing in the, in the partition. Right, that's why it should be a partition. It should be, it should be um, distributing the elements into non-empty and uh, and uh, disjoint subsets. Right, that's what's going on. So this is like non-emptiness, but phrased um, using inhabitedness, and this is disjoint. But again, it's like a homotopy type style of phrasing that's using the contractibility here. Um, so there is a, and, and in fact, so it's a little bit stronger than this jointness uh, because it's saying that every element has to be somewhere, right? That's the other thing that the contractability is giving you and um, covers all of A. Every element has to be somewhere in the partition. Okay, um, we have this type and then we would like this to be equivalent to um, one of them, like all of them, but um, I'm going to pick the first one. Okay, so show one and four equivalent. All right. Okay, so remember that one is a decidable, the type of decidable equivalence relations on A. So let's do that one first. So given R, a decidable equivalence relation on A, we construct a partition B which goes from A to D prop, so the side of all subsets of A into D prop. 
Okay, what do we do? So we say P of Q has to be something. Well, what do we need to do? First of all, we need to make sure that if we have a Q and P of Q holds, then Q needs to be inhabited. So, um, um actually we don't need to we don't need to yeah we we're working, it's gonna follow actually um let's see what we want is we want that uh, one yeah i think it should be this let me just check a in B in A, uh, A, excuse me. So A is related to B if and only if uh, Q and this. So let's see, is this indeed in a Um Yeah, so I think this should be, um, hang on, I'm a little bit confused. Um, Yeah, this doesn't look right to me. Um, I so I think the idea should be that um, um, yeah, yeah. So I think it should be um, I think it should be A in A such that Q is lambda B uh, A R B. So in other words, um, given the equivalence relation, we take an element of A and then we look at all the things that it relates. And that that like that that bunches up one part of the partition. And then we go to the next element and then we look at all the things that it relates and that's another bunch in the partition. And you kind of keep going like that. And so P of Q is saying that Q has to be one of those bunches, right? There has to be an A such that Q is exactly all the things related to A. That's, what, that's the things that Q collects. Um, so that's what, um, that's what this, uh, this should be, I believe. Uh, Where did the yeah. first thing come from? Sorry, the first what? The what, the what was written initially. Um, yeah, I think what was happening, I was, I had this, this, the same idea in mind, but. Um, oh, it just I didn't look I right. It didn't work things. out like you thought it did. Yeah, I think it was just like a little bit. Yeah, I, I didn't fix the first variable. I think that's what right. kind of right. threw me off a little bit. Um, that, that what you just said makes sense, though. I, I just was curious. Right. Yeah, no, okay, good. Um, yeah, it's a little bit late as well here, so maybe that's creeping up on me. Um, anyway, this, this is the idea. Um, and we can have a quick look at the conditions. So let's say if uh, P of Q, right, if this holds, then uh, Q is lambda B A R B for A and A. And then is Q inhabited? Well, but yes, this... because uh, R is reflexive, right? So right. in particular, it needs to contain A. Um, so the reflexivity is used to show that Q is inhabited. Um, and then we would have to do this. So that's one condition for the partition. And the other condition would be that if we have a Q from A to D prop, 
and p of q holds uh, and q of x. So this is we like let x in A. So this type should be contractable. Uh, let's have a look at this. So writing this out, we have Q from B to prop. And then here we have A and A. Uh, Q is lambda B A R B times uh, Q of X. Um, and then, so, okay, I'm gonna like roughly sketch this. So this is saying that uh, A is related to uh, X. Uh, uh. Ah, yeah, right. So, um, so Q is like, is completely, like, is completely, like this, this type here is just, we're just saying like, okay, we're only considering Qs that are basically saying uh, the elements are related to some element. But here we already know that Q is like looking at this particular X. So like this, this type should have a unique element, namely the relation uh, B, such that X is related to B. Okay, we're, we're like looking at the, I mean, if you like, this is like the equivalence class of X. Okay, and that's, what's, that, that's what we're doing here. Um, that was maybe slightly hand wavy, but I hope you'll believe me on this. And if not, the solution will be out later as well. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? So right, it's okay. almost like you could take the the fact that you know A is related to X, and then like use some kind of transitivity to like get that more in like the form where it's like Q is equal to something, and that looks more like the natural kind of like contractibility. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So actually, let me let me write that here in a like little note. Um, yeah. So. That's exactly right. So you should have, you should be able to, I mean, yeah, like for lack of time, I'm going to do it here, but you should have something like A into D prop and then saying that Q is equal to lambda right. RB. And right. I think and that this is contractible. Right. And yeah. I think that that'd probably just be like a step or two, maybe with the fact that we know right. A is related to X. Yeah, you would need you would need transitivity because uh, the A would be related to X, and then you're going on. Yeah, and maybe symmetry. You maybe need symmetry too to turn X and A around. Yeah, possibly. Um, maybe you could set it up in such a way that you wouldn't need this per se. But yeah, um, say so. Antonio is saying you're identifying all A's related to X and taking X as equivalence class. Yeah, exactly. Um, like we're we're basically saying here that Q has to be an equivalence class. But at the same time, we know X is in there. So right. it has to be the equivalence class given by X. Uh, right. Yeah, so I think that's a good way of looking at it. So this is saying Q is an equivalence class. And then this is saying Q contains X. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, thanks. Thanks for that, that was great. Uh, Okay, so final step would be to go the other direction. So in other words, to go from this uh, kind of very explicit partition thing down to a decidable equivalence relation. And I think the viewpoint we just had is gonna be very, very helpful here. Um, so four to one. So we're given a partition 
B. So let's go in A to the B prop to B prop. Okay. Um, with, with all of these requirements, right? Okay, so now we have to define uh, R from A to A to D prop, and then it should be an equivalence relation. Um, all right, okay, so given we're gonna, I mean, we have to define this, so we're gonna take uh, an A and a B uh, in A, and then I'm going to use of this second uh, fact here. So, so this bit, because now I have an A and a B, and I know that this type here is contractible, right? So let me just write that down. So given A and B, I look at Q from A to B prop such that it's in the partition and um, it contains A, let's say, right, this is contractible. So um, this yields a Q subscript A from A to B probe such that B of QA and QA contains A, right? Um, just using the contractability, and similarly, I get a QB with the same thing. So with the viewpoint that we had above, this is really just like what we're doing is we're just saying like, look at the equivalence class of A, and then this one is the equivalence class of B, right? But just using this sort of fancy machinery of the contractability. It gives me this unique element, and that's the Q, but that's really thinking of that as the equivalence class. Um, okay, and then when should A and B be related? Well, ex exactly when their equivalence classes are equal, right? So now we define A, R, B. Um, to B that QA equals QB, okay? Um, now, this is an equivalence relation exactly because the equality is an equivalence relation, right? So that's fine. But then we also need to check that this is actually decidable, All right? So why is that the case? That would be good to check. Let me just make a new page and scroll up a bit. Um, so why is why is Q and A equals Q B the side? Um, well, that's because so so Q A is a function from A into D prop, right? So using function extensionality, I get that this type is equivalent to saying that for every A, if Q of A is equal to Q B. Uh, sorry, let Did me you say X? That's that's terrible. Sorry about that. <laughs> Why was it the first thing I wrote? I have to like undo everything in order to anyway. <laughs> uh, Q A X equals Q B X, right? Uh, that's just the uh, function uh, extension of A. Okay. Um, and then now those are both decidable props, so. Right, exactly. So then we could like spell this out a little bit, I guess we could sort of say, well, these things will be equal as soon as they are, like they imply each other, right? Because right. it's the equations. So this is prop x, this is on x. Um, okay, but then here, so what do we do to, so what do we do to, to decide this, this is decidable because I just decide the left-hand side, now I decide the right-hand side. And, you know, this is true if and only if they were both true or they were both false, right? I just decide both of them and you have like a little true table. The point is though, that I'm still doing this quantification over everything here, 
but this is fine because A is finite. Uh, right. So that's kind of builds us out here, if you like. Uh, so we have a, um, let's say a finite quantification uh, over decidable things. Right, in other words, I just check for the first element of A, I check for the second element of A, the third and so on, until I, I enumerated everything and then I know I'm done. Um, but actually that's, that's where the finiteness uh, assumption that was kind of, you know, floating around all the time, maybe not, um, like it's not immediately clear where, where you would use this, but here is actually a place where you would, um, where this comes in quite useful. Um, so that's why I wanted to highlight that. Okay, it is exactly 8.30 where I currently am, um, which means this took about like half an hour, which is great, exactly how long I, would, I, I thought it would take. Um, are there any questions at this point? I can also stop the recording and then you can ask some questions post the recording if you like. If you have something that you think will be beneficial for everyone, please do ask it now and ask on chat as well. Nope. Okay, awesome. Then let me just stop the recording.